Welcome everyone to our first uh, inaugural meeting of the Phoenix chapter of TinyML. Um, it's uh, been a, a, a long time coming and we're really excited to have you here listening in. Um, uh, my name is Surin Jayasuriya from Arizona State University and I'll be, act as the moderator for this session. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of exciting speakers that we'll introduce you to, including our main speaker, Michael Mike Stanley, who will be talking about implementation, implementation considerations for machine learning at the edge of the cloud. Uh, just a reminder, during the talks, you can uh, use the Q&A functionality to uh, ask questions. And at the end, we will have a Q&A uh, where you can raise your hand and participate uh, with further questions. So uh, just uh, to... Uh, to acknowledge our TinyML talk sponsors that make these talks and webcasts possible, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, SynSense, Reality AI, and Kitso. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Andrea Spanius from a Arizona State University to give us an introduction to the TinyML Phoenix chapter. Just a brief introduction for those of you who don't know Professor Spanius. He's a professor at the School of Electrical, Computer, and Energy Engineering at ASU, has done numerous works in the area of D DSP and uh, now more recently machine learning. So I'll let him take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, first uh, tiny ML chapter meeting in Phoenix. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of the history of this. I of course, some of this discussion started through my involvement with the uh, industry consortium that we're running uh, at ASU. And uh, back in 2018, uh, in the meeting, Evgeny uh, told me about the first uh, uh, tiny machine learning summit, uh, which happened at Google in Sunnyvale. And it was a great success. Uh, I, I think that they've had 100 plus attendees and I think that if they had more room, they would have had probably th three times as many. Um, at that time also, uh, they started there also a meetup in the Silicon Valley and which picked up very quickly. Um, we, uh, we attended with uh, Suren also the second tiny machine learning summit uh, at Qualcomm the first day and close to the San Francisco airport the, the second day because they've had uh, a lot of requests for registration and so on. So that meeting ha had more than 400 attendees. Uh, I think that Evgeny is going to make you aware of that. Uh, they, some of the numbers that they've had in the uh, Tiny ML uh, Foundation and the summits. But uh, we started the engagement with several companies through our NSF uh, Sensitive Consortium and there was industry interest demonstrated in low power machine learning. Uh, some of our engagements with the, with the speaker we have today, Mike Stanley from NXP had to do with uh, embedding machine learning uh, software on a, on a uh, small NXP board with sensors. So we initiated some discussions for a chapter in Phoenix uh, late in the fall of 2019 and early in the spring of 2020. And we planned the first meeting in March 2020, which did not happen because of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and uh, you can see Evgeny and, and Pete Warden in the picture before they were the uh, organizers and they launched the TinyML Foundation and the first uh, meeting chairs. Let's go to the next slide. So we formed a uh, chapter steering committee, uh, Suren, who you met, Steve Wally, many of you uh, know him from his involvement in MEMS and sensors. Uh, Mike Stanley, uh, just retired from NXP, but still active and working with our center. And he's gonna give you the talk today. Uh, Margaret Niffin from NXP, uh, Claire Jankowski from Intel, and myself uh, and so this is our steering committee and we would like to get more involvement and and we really would welcome more involvement from industry because this is about industry and machine learning um, so i think this is my last slide and i can turn it to evgeny to give you a little bit of the history of the tiny ml foundation Thank you, Andreas, and uh, it's really a pleasure to start this uh, local chapter of Tiny ML uh, in Phoenix or in the Phoenix, in the Greater Phoenix area. As uh, Andreas mentioned, we've been talking about this for 
for some time and now it's kind of good to see this coming uh, to fruition. So uh, my name is Evgeny Gusev, I am from Qualcomm and also I am one of the co-founders of TinyML Foundation and now I am on the board of directors there. Uh, so just a couple of introductory slides uh, for this audience. I think many of you know what TinyML is. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, tiny machine learning really enables uh, uh, artificial intelligence right at the boundary of the physical and digital world, as you see here. So on one hand, you have analog world with a lot of uh, data coming from sensors and other type of devices. And then this information is getting converted into the digital. And then the tiny ML uh, actually does all this information collection and digestion at the at the at the very edge of the physical world and, and the digital world. And uh, it has a lot of benefits, like it's the most energy efficient way of um, compute, of AI compute. It's secure by design. It has no issues with the connectivity and it's very fast and uh, best latency. And the reason why we're excited about this, uh, actually before you go there, yeah, uh, so and if, you, if you click on the definition, that's basically what I said, next page is, uh, uh, same kind of definition, but in words. So I think we define TinyML very broadly as a combination of architectures, tools, techniques, and approaches that can do on-device analytics for all kind of variety mo modalities, um, uh, sensor modalities like vision, audio, motion, chemical. But the key here that all this happens at extremely low uh, power, like less than milliwatt or less, and it, because of this, it has a lot of applications as shown on the next slide. And that's why we are very bullish about TinyML because TinyML now is already in many, many applications. And I think uh, very soon it's going to be in the heart of everything. So you see all these uh, verticals, uh, you see industrial IoT, medical, you have smart home, you have uh, AR, VR, um, you have automotive, wearable. So tiny ML is, is, is already in many of these applications and it, it will be everywhere because again, that's where the physical world, that's where the data meets the, the um, analytics, um, the intelligent world. And there will be a lot of applications. We are very excited about this. So, and uh, we realized this and we recognize this uh, vision uh, about a year and a half ago. And that's how this uh, foundation started. So it started as a nonprofit organization with the mission really to promote uh, ecosystem development and technology deployment uh, of uh, TinyML um, across the globe, across different verticals, across different disciplines. And um, the, see, here you see just some numbers. So um, since then in a year, the community has grown to more than 3000 people. As of today, it's actually 3,200 3, people and there are 23 groups in 17 countries. And the Phoenix group has already quite quite significant size. It's over 100 people and it keeps growing. So that's that's quite exciting. And again, the message here, very fast grows because of the uh, demand in this type of technology. And it's everywhere, everywhere and it's global. And uh, just to give a little bit of also for some of you who are not familiar with TinyML, what we do, I think on the next page, we show some of the activities happening so we were planning to have a European meeting. Um, it got moved to next year uh, because of the COVID. Uh, Tiny Email Asia is going to happen um, this year and it will be a virtual event in the fall. Um, and um, uh, next year we already uh, planning uh, next summit. I think that Andreas mentioned we had two events in 19 and 20. So next summit is in, 20, in, in March of next year. And additionally, we do all these uh, meetup groups all over the world uh, after uh, COVID in, in, in March, we started bi-weekly webcasts. They've been very successful. And if you have um, an interest in participating, you can contact talks at tinyemail.org. And all the information is open. There is a tiny email YouTube channel. It has uh, close to uh, 1,500,000 people. Users and subscribers, and if you just want to get involved, in a nutshell, uh, it's uh, go to tinyml.org, and you'll see all the information there um, are up to date. So, it, just to summarize again, we are very happy, very excited uh, 
in um, uh, starting this um, local event in, in Phoenix. Uh, there is a very big technological high-tech community there. And Steve uh, Wally is going to talk a little bit about this in a moment. And um, uh, I think today we're going to have a very interesting program with Mike presenting the tiny email on microcontrollers. Again, very exciting time to be, and we look forward to working with, with this group and, and make it successful. Great. Thank you, Evgeny. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Steve Wally. Uh, Steve Wally is the CEO for Strategic World Ventures. He, many of you know him. He's been very active here in the Valley and was uh, works a lot with several companies and as well as with MEMS and Sensors Technology. Uh, Steve? Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> I think as uh, people have said, um, I have a strong interest in MEMS and Sensors, having worked at Intel for five or six years while I was there, just that uh, my last few years at Intel before I pseudo retired, and I'm failing miserably at retirement, but I, I love MEMS and sensors, and obviously sensors play a big part of the edge uh, computing world today. And with Professor Spanius and others in Sensip, we've been involved in the machine learning side of, of sensors in the Valley for some time. Obviously with big companies like NXP, uh, OnSemi, Microchip, Intel, et cetera, plus some of the ecosystem partners. Uh, this is definitely a, a hotbed for sensor activity and therefore machine learning activity and TinyML uh, as a natural extension to that as we move into more edge and low power uh, computing. Um, so why, uh, why do we want a Phoenix chapter? Well, because of that activity, we really wanna get the word out in, in the valley and you know we're talking about Phoenix, but um, it, you know this could extend to Tucson. We may have a Tucson chapter eventually, maybe even a Flagstaff uh, chapter. But for now, let's get it going with Phoenix and pull people in from the rest of the state. Uh, but it's really about getting the information out about um, TinyML. There's a there's a plethora of information um, that uh, goes on in some of the TinyML webinars that are almost every two weeks now on a worldwide basis. We'll be doing more that pertain locally uh, to Phoenix and Arizona. Uh, we'll do training. Uh, part of the session that Mike's gonna do today is a general training session. Um, and it's all about evangelism, getting the word out. How do we scale? How do we understand what's going on? Who are the partners, et cetera, that we can team up with both in Arizona and in uh, states beyond and even the world. Uh, we do need your help. Um, so if you're interested in uh, serving on the steering committee, uh, just let us know that via the emails and information uh, details we'll give you later on. Uh, we're definitely looking for speakers and topics. We'd like to do a webinar every month, if not even more frequently, but for now, let's say every month. So if you're interested or you're already using uh, TinyML, uh, send, us info, send us topics and uh, we'll be you know, glad to review them. And uh, like I said, hopefully uh, we're going to continue these on a monthly basis going forward. And then we'd love to get to in-person meetings when conditions permit so that we can not only exchange information, but you know, have that networking face to face. But for now, I think uh, the webinar approach is working very well and uh, you get to stay home or you get to stay in your office without having to travel. Uh, so it's got some benefits and efficiencies. But with that, I'm, I'm happy to uh, hand this over to Saran again and introduce the, the main speaker of the day. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, yes, uh, great. So on to the main part of this webinar. Um, so today we have a talk uh, by Mike Stanley on implementation considerations for machine learning at the edge of the cloud. Mike is, uh, was formerly at NXP, is now uh, doing a lot of things uh, with the ASU Sensor Group and also with the tiny machine learning community. Just a logistical note, if you have questions during the presentation, Mike is okay with you asking them during the presentation. And if you write it in the Q&A functionality via Zoom, I can periodically chime in to ask these questions as the talk, or you can wait till the end uh, where, the, where we'll have the Q&A section to ask your questions. So please use the Q&A functionality. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mike. Thank you, Saren. 
And, and as Saren said, uh, we're certainly open to having um, questions posed during the course of the presentation. It's, I'm going to be talking about a, a topic that I've worked in for a number of years before leaving NXP, and it's near and dear to my heart. So I, I welcome the chance to have a conversation. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to, to my friends at NXP. Uh, we've reused a lot of material here that uh, was developed while I was at NXP, a lot of the training material. Uh, and also, I, I want to note that a lot of this was presented at the Sensors and Machine Learning Symposium last November that was hosted by CENSIP, which is the consortium at ASU. Having said that, let me go ahead and get started. And what I want to do is a set a context. Uh, while I was at NXP for my last 18 months before I retired, I was leading a team that was essentially targeting embedded machine learning applications. And what we were doing is we were putting together a platform that we could hand to our customers where the machine learning engine was pre-implemented. And, and all they would have to do is essentially collect their data, train their model, and then download the model back to, to, to the uh, platform. The idea was that they could take that machine learning component and treat it as a subcomponent into a larger system. We were trying to make machine learning a, re, a easily reusable technology, something that is in everybody's uh, toolbox in terms of things that they can work on. So that, that was our goal. We're focusing on enablement. And uh, if you look at the markets where that kind of thing was, was applicable, uh, machine home uh, building condition monitoring, uh, those are very big markets. Uh, white goods, smart home. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the customers that we're talking to are people who are making washing machines and dryers and things like that. Uh, in, in addition, uh, you, you're going to find that, and in CERN, I'm having a little bit of trouble uh, proceeding here, so if I get stalled, I'll ask for some help. Uh, environmental monitoring is, an, is another one we talked about, home security systems, uh, smart locks. Uh, really what I want to try to get at is, is machine learning is, is a tool that you can use in many, many products today. And again, we were working on embedded machine learning enablement. Now, what you're going to find is that actually involves a lot more than just the algorithms. We tend to focus on algorithms. When you pick up machine learning book, it's heavy on algorithms. You know, you're going to learn all about TensorFlow or you're going to learn all about uh, scikit-learn or, or whatever technology that you're using, but they don't talk about what you actually have to do to take those techniques and actually apply them in the field. So the next uh, half hour or 40 minutes, that's what we're going to be focused on is, is all the stuff that wraps around that. Because what I found uh, in my time at Motorola is the actual machine learning component of it, of what we were working on, was maybe only 10 to 15 percent of, of our daily lives. Most of our lives was involved in all the stuff that wraps around it, which is every bit as important because you can't do the job without it. So I'll be talking about machine learning as we go through here, but I'll also be talking about all the things that are peripheral to that that you need to actually make a working system. Uh, to, again, to, to put things in context, let's just take a look at the design flow that I've, I've, I'm showing here. This is actually a design flow that I used uh, to put together a demo uh, a, a couple years back. And, and the idea here was I wanted to implement uh, a virtual keyboard on the back of my laptop. So if I tapped on, on uh, a particular location on my keyboard or on the back of the laptop, it would act as if it was a key. So I wanted to differentiate different locations on that, on that uh, laptop. And the way we started out was we had uh, a development board, which was literally mounted to the laptop. Uh, and you see it here. And on that development board, we would have a small data logger application. And we could essentially dial into that board from our PC and we could collect data uh, corresponding with the various events that we wanted to use to train our algorithm. That data ended up in a standard comma delimited format, you know, that CSV format that most of us in, in, in this area are used to seeing every day. And you can load these things up into Excel and view them there if you want to. And then you see the various steps in the process here. The first thing we typically do is we'll extract features 
from that raw data. And then in this case, I needed to do some feature isolation or filtering because I, I'm trying to isolate the tap uh, events. So I'll put a threshold in there, run a small filter and pull out just the portions or, or just the lines in, in those .csv files that correspond to the events I'm interested in. Then I've got to focus on feature selection. What features do I want? And you'll notice here I'm talking about more traditional machine learning. So if this was a deep learning model, I'd be, I'd be talking about an algorithm that's likely to learn its own features. But uh, with the types of algorithms I was using, and, and I'll get more to that here in a minute, uh, I really was doing my own feature engineering. Uh, once I've got those features, I would generate a model, and I was using OpenCV to generate my models. Now that could be any type of machine learning library there. We happen to settle on OpenCV uh, because I had asked our team at NXP uh, to go away and to do an evaluation. And the, cent the central uh, machine learning organization did an evaluation at my request. And they were looking at uh, a lot of different factors. They were looking at portability. They were looking at the numbers of algorithms that were available. Uh, they were looking at memory size and so forth. And they eventually settled on OpenCV as having a nice uh, ability uh, for us to, to model using a lot of different uh, algorithms uh, without uh, restricting ourselves. And it was a very nice framework for us to use. So what we did is we actually ported OpenCV to the microcontroller that we were using. Now, the nice thing about OpenCV was we could run those, those models on our laptops. We could run OpenCV models in the cloud, or we could run them on the MCU. And that turns out to be really important for a scalable type of solution. Now, once you've got your model, uh, OpenCV can essentially write that model in an XML format that we could deploy to the cloud, or our scripts also generated uh, .h and .cpp files that we could drop right back into the same embedded framework that you see here, where we could essentially recompile uh, an updated version of our data logger application, and we could field that new model on exactly the same hardware that we used to do our initial data collection. So you know, that's the flow that we were working to in terms of how we were going about implementing um, machine learning. And, and what you see up here along the top is at various points along the way, we're taking peeks at our data to, to help us in our feature engineering. So that's, that's what you see uh, along here. Mike, we have one question. Okay. Uh, which is, uh, what is XIDE on this slide? X, oh, IDE, that stands for Integrated Development Environment. So typically uh, for any type of embedded platform, uh, regardless of which vendor that you, you're getting your platform from, there'll be some type of development system that you can use to do C and C++ development. Uh, and, and the particular development uh, at, at NXP was uh, Eclipse-based, which many of us are used to. So essentially, it's just a wrapper around standard uh, open source tools for, for doing C and C++ development. And then you can download from that IDE to the board. There we go. Okay, and, and this slide, I just want to touch real quickly on the fact that it takes a lot to build a full solution. Again, we tend to focus on just the machine learning aspects of it, but you also need to be aware of a lot of things. You need to be aware of your platform. What kind of microcontroller or microprocessor are you going to be using? What kind of communications uh, are involved? Uh, what type of sensors do you need to solve the problem that you're trying to solve? Uh, do you have the drivers necessary to do this? Have you considered security? If you're building an application that's going to be connected to the web, you better be considering security. Uh, data visualization, open source uh, uh, tools. Uh, all, all, well, you can see the list here. Uh, and I'm going to be going through those as we go through the, the rest of these slides. So one thing I mentioned a moment ago is, is the processor architecture. People who aren't in the business may not realize you have a couple choices to make. Typically, I refer to this as microcontroller versus microprocessor. Microcontrollers tend to have on-chip memory, and that's usually flash memory plus RAM. 
but the amount of flash memory is, is usually somewhat limited by the technology node that we build the, these microcontrollers on. But on the flip side, we have much lower latency than off-chip memory. Uh, so it, if you can have on-chip memory, you want to you use that. A microprocessor is, is typically going to be using off-chip memory. So if you think about this, uh, the difference between these two classes here, an Arduino uh, might be a microcontroller-based system. A Raspberry Pi would be a microprocessor-based system, or your laptop even. So, so a laptop is going to be using a, a microprocessor. The microcontroller is going to tend to be self-contained. The, the microprocessor is going to require more support circuitry. Uh, on the microcontroller, typically you're not running a, a full operating system. You're either running what we call bare metal C and C++ or some type of a real-time operating system. Versus over on the MPU, you're typically going to be Linux-based. Uh, there's a new addition to, to software engineering in the last five years that I found really interesting. It's something called containers. And with a container, you can essentially put a wrapper around an application plus all the dependencies of that application. And you can use that container to deploy it to uh, microprocessors in the field. Well, microcontrollers don't typically support containers. Microprocessors do. And this is actually how uh, server farms work is that you know, the server farms have the ability to create a container and very easily deploy it to lots of servers uh, in the farm. Going back over here, the microcontroller has the ability to do hard real-time sampling of sensors. And that's really important for certain types of analysis. For instance, if you're gonna do like a, a Fourier analysis that's going to look at the frequency content of your signal, it's really important that you ha have the ability to, to tightly control the timing of your samples. You typically don't have that level of control on a microprocessor. You could get close, but it's not gonna be you know, all, all the way there. Typically your microprocessor is gonna be much higher cost. Uh, the microcontrollers are available sometimes for just a dollar or two or less. Uh, there was a question a minute ago about development tools. This is the development tool we were using. So this was MCU Expresso, and essentially this is a, a, an Eclipse type of environment. Uh, so it, it makes it very easy to, to develop uh, your code in a nice modern software environment. Uh, typically, the choice of, a, of an embedded IDE is going to be driven by your choice of an MCU. Uh, the, you'll find that for any given family of MCUs, there might be a, a selection of three to five different tools that are available to you. So you're not going to necessarily be limited to one tool, but you'll be limited to a subset. Uh, the MCU language support usually involves Assembler, C and C++. Uh, software support at the MPU level is much more extensive. Anything you can do in Linux, you can do in an MPU. So you know, conceivably, you could even run Python in an MPU. You're not going to do that on a microcontroller. Uh, machine learning models are going to be embedded in one of two ways, either as source code. In other words, you actually translate your machine learning model to C and C++ compile it and embed it in, in your application, or you generate data that's executed by an inference engine that's running on the MCU. Both are perfectly valid approaches and I've seen, seen and done both. Uh, your machine learning scripts can be, as I said, crafted to support either approach. I typically run my stuff uh, within a, a, a Jupyter environment and we'll talk about that briefly here in a moment. Since you're writing the code, it's easy to do, go with either approach. We use Visual Studio for our tool of choice for Windows graphical user interface development. Uh, I mentioned a minute ago that you, you have to have some type of a data collection tool. That's where this comes into, into play. Uh, and then we used uh, Visual Studio code that was used by Microsoft as part of their plug and play device capability model. Uh, this was for that stage of the project where we were adding uh, cloud support. So the ability for our board to actually connect directly to the cloud. Uh, 
Open source tools is, is probably, whoop, there we go, thank you. Uh, open source tools, as, as many of us know, are prevalent in the machine learning community. Uh, and the wonderful thing about that is you're getting world-class tools essentially for free. Uh, and so anybody can download the, the Anaconda distribution, which, which supports R and Python, and also supports the Jupyter environment. And I'm a big believer in Jupyter notebooks. I use that for everything I do now uh, because it's self-documenting. I can include all of my documentation right into the notebook along with the code. Uh, notebooks are easily shared. I use them for training purposes. Uh, when I was working with customers, in many cases, I would be working with customers who were new to machine learning. And what I would do is I would essentially seed their machine learning effort by giving them some of my notebooks. And that would help them up the learning curve. Uh, the Jupyter ecosystem is still being actively expanded, so there's new ca capabilities all, all the time. And also, as I noted earlier, Python supports OpenCV, which means we can train models offline and then export to our embedded environment. Mike, uh, there was uh, just uh, two quick questions. One was about, uh, did you consider using uh, the MicroPython distribution? And then the second question was uh, to talk a little bit about your the choice of containers and is, the, is there a trade-off between efficiency and speed? Okay. Uh, with regard to MicroPython, it wasn't really an option when we started the project. Uh, and, and it certainly, you know, basically that's, that's the short answer. It, it wasn't an option. Um, I'm also not aware that I have the ability within MicroPython to actually run the types of algorithms that I want to. I haven't seen that, that you're actually going to have access to machine learning libraries at this point in time, uh, even with the stuff I've been looking at. I've been tinkering with CircuitPython recently, and it doesn't appear to have the abilities that I need to do the machine learning aspect. I can use it to, to do sampling of my sensors. And I think that there's some, some applicability there, and I'm going to be exploring that uh, on some of the boards I have. Uh, the other question was uh, containers. Uh, I didn't spend any time myself uh, uh, getting involved with choices of containers. Uh, a sister project within the same business group I was working with was working with um, the ability to, to containerize uh, the, the Amazon uh, voice recognition system. Uh, so they were making heavy use of it, but I couldn't really comment beyond that. But for an MCU, typically containers simply aren't an option. Now, the, the downside of that is if I want a field upgradable piece of software, it typically means I'm going to have to have a custom bootloader that can support being able to do that, that field uh, upgrade. So it means that there's more work because there is no generic mechanism available for us to, to take advantage. On the M MPU side, the, the microprocessor, those capabilities are there and you want to take advantage of them so you don't have to create that set of libraries yourself. It's a lot of work. Can you take me to the next page there, sir? Thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about communications options. A, a lot of uh, tiny ML applications may be totally self self-contained. But even if they're self-contained, you're still going to have communication to the sensors on your board. Uh, and, and there are a whole bunch of different types of buses running around on your board or, or different types of interfaces. By far, the two most popular that I deal with are I squared C and SPI. Uh, and you'll typically find that your sensors fall into to those two categories. Uh, Low-cost microphones may send out one bit at a time, so they're going to be more similar to the pulse density modulation that you see here. Or you may have a, an analog interface. Uh, and then also you're going to have uh, memory interfaces. So a, a lot of different options in terms of the types of things that you're going to deal with. It's very helpful if you can have, uh, well, let's back up. If you're developing your own hardware and your own drivers, it's very helpful to have uh, an embedded software engineer on your team who can get down and dirty with your hardware because you'll spend a lot of time on drivers if somebody else doesn't hand them to you. This was the bulk of the effort that I had on this last project I'm going to be showing you. 
Uh, so it, it, it is a lot of work to develop those drivers. Uh, if you're commuting, communicating off chip, uh, again, you have to consider the, the, the medium that you're using and you have to consider the bandwidth limitations, especially if you have high speed um, sensors like microphones. Uh, you know, high speed microphones that you might be using, for instance, for a machine condition monitoring application, you may be sampling at 32 kilohertz or at 48 kilohertz or higher. That's a huge amount of data to move across. Uh, and typically you may be having to deal with direct memory interface or, or DMA on your MCU to move that data across. So you need somebody who, who's aware of those types of interfaces and deal with it. Once you get off, uh, off board, you've got to make sure that you've got the bandwidth to, to convey that information. Typically, the more data that you're moving, the more issues you're going to have with regard to reliability and having to deal with those types of issues. So we've been talking a lot uh, you know, about hardware. This is the, the little board that we actually put together uh, within my team. Uh, and the reason we did this at the time was, well, A, I'm trying to, to sell uh, machine learning enablement for NXP silicon. So, so keep that in mind that, that that was our end goal to do this as an enablement type of thing. So there's a, there's a NXP MCU sitting on the other side of this board. But B, we couldn't find uh, a board that was small enough with the sensor complement that we were after because I wanted something that could easily be attached to a small motor or could be attached to any type of appliance and you would hardly even be able to, to notice it's, that it's there. It needed to be small. It needed to, to essentially not have a lot of mass associated with it because it turns out that a lot of the sensors that you're using, uh, the, you're measuring vibrations. So you want as little mass on your board as possible so it takes less energy to couple those vibrations from the machine that you're monitoring to your sensors. So it's, it's very important to keep it small. Uh, but that can have uh, implications on the other side. You may find that your board may uh, have a little bit of self-heating. And in fact, we found that here. Uh, even though we were aware of the risk and we took some, some uh, steps to mitigate it, we still saw a 10 to 15 degree increase on the board temperature over the ambient. So you have to take those things into account. Uh, and here you, you see a whole bunch of different sensor types that are on here, and, you know, a PIR sensor for, for, for detecting movement, ambient light sensors, temperature, humidity. Uh, as I said, we had a three axis gyro, we had pressure sensor, we had an accelerometer, a magnetometer, anything that we could think of, we put on the board. And again, we were targeting machine and home and building condition monitoring. That was the application space we were going after. If you have a different type of system that you're doing tiny ML for, you may have a different sensor complement. Now, having said all that, uh, since then, uh, you're starting to see some very nice boards come out, uh, you know, in addition to, to, to this one that we did at NXP. So there are some other options out there. Uh, the Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense is a great little board, and it, it's, it's being used by a lot of people in the tiny ML community. So that's another one you might want to look at. Uh, printed circuit topics, PC, PCB size. As I said, the printed circuit board size is, is really important. This one was 30 by 40 millimeters. So it's about the size of a book of, of matches. Now here we actually had a, a two board stack up. So there's a, there's a couple small connectors between these two boards. And one of the things we found when we built it was we had some issues with board to board stability. They would actually rock from side to side. So we had to, to build some features into our uh, enclosure, which you'll see in a moment, to make sure that we manage that properly. So physical aspects of the design become important. Now again, if you're using somebody else's hardware, you're not gonna have those issues. Sensor access to the environment. You can't just take this board and stick it inside a, a hermetic enclosure. You know, if you're measuring things like air pressure, temperature, uh, if you're measuring CO2, CO2 content in, in the air, it's important that you've got access to the environment, which means you need to have a vented enclosure. How many layers does that printed circuit board have? 
do you have the ability to, to hotwire uh, changes to that board, especially with brand new boards that you're designing? It's important that you can fix problems that are found in those initial prototypes. So you want to build your board with that in mind. You need to be concerned about EMC and magnetic interference. If you want to sell a board, typically you've got to go through uh, FCC compliance testing. This is a huge deal. And unfortunately, you don't really know about this until you've got the board in hand and you can do the testing. So anybody that's a good board designer, they've got a lot of um, techniques in their back pocket that they know to try to limit these types of issues. But even then, you're going to have to pay attention to make sure you incorporate it. Any questions? Okay. Uh, ease of closure. How, how easy is that to put into an enclosure? Also, Give me one second. Uh, let me try to please mute yourself if you're muted. There we go. There we go. Sorry about that, Mike. Thank you. So, so some of these sensors are inertial sensors. That means, means that they're actually measuring um, three axis uh, vectors. For example, here specifically, we're talking about accelerometer, magnetometer, and a gyroscope. It's important that those sensors have their X, Y, and Z axes aligned. Now, if they're not aligned, you can correct that mathematically in your drivers, but it's a heck of a lot easier if you just do the, the job right up front on your printed circuit board. Uh, we've already talked about self-heating and thermal conductance issues. Here's one, LEDs. Every board that, that, <laughs> that I've used in the last 20 years has always had multiple LEDs on it for various uh, status purposes. Well, guess what? An LED, if you, if you have a light sensor on your board, you better be turning off the LED when you're using your light sensor to measure the ambient light levels. Antenna placement. This little board actually had two different antennas because we had two different radios on it. We had a, a, uh, a Bluetooth antenna on one side and we had a Wi-Fi antenna on the other side. And you can see the connectors right, right here. So you, you, you want to make sure that you try to keep those away from your sensors and, and keep high current traces away from your sensors. Here's one that I never expected. The shape of the PCB port for the microphone. The microphone actually mounts on the bottom of, of the sensor board, which is on the, on the flip side of this picture. It turns out you have to have a funnel shape on the board that's drilled into the PCB. Our initial prototypes didn't, and what that meant was when we actually fired up our prototype and started gathering data, there was distortion in the sound. It was physical distortion. There was some, nothing we could do about it until we corrected the physical shape of the PCB, uh, uh, the hole in, in the PCB itself. So you know, this is kind of the hard knocks type of things that you have to worry about. Uh, you know, are you gonna have access to the various ports on this thing when this thing is enclosed in your enclosure? And then of course, bill of material cost. This doesn't do you any good if this board costs twice what you can sell it for. You've got to be able to get the cost down to a level that's going to map, uh, match up with the market that you're targeting. Now, in my case, I was trying to build enablement so I could fudge a little bit. I could put more sensors here with the idea that my customers, when they were taking this subsystem and dropping it into their design, they could just not populate those sensors. But if you're building something for your own product, you've got to keep that in mind. Packaging. Certainly the easiest way to do this early and, and something that wasn't an option 10 years ago is an option today. And that's using uh, inexpensive 3D printers uh, to print your, your early enclosures. Uh, and, and in many cases, I was printing extra enclosures here at home. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's that easy to do nowadays. So, so that's a great way to go about this. Uh, eventually, you're, you're going to want to, to use uh, other techniques. You're going to want to use injection molding because at scale, that's going to be more inexpensive. But up front, it's much more expensive. Uh, those initial prototypes can be done for, for pennies, whereas injection molding is going to require you know, thousands of dollars of upfront tooling. 
The other thing you need to pay attention here is the, the, the choice of materials, uh, PLA versus ABS versus other available materials. Some of those can affect your radios. Uh, again, that's not something I was aware of when we first started working on the project. But you know, be forewarned. The other thing to be aware about is that some of these materials are flammable. Uh, one, way to go, one way to find out is, uh, you know, take a piece of material and see if you can turn it on fire. So that's going to be an issue uh, as you go through these certification processes. And then, you know, how is the end product package for delivery to the consumer? The boxing, the graphics. You need to make it pretty for any type of, of a, a system that people are actually going to be uh, seeing as part of the product. Now, if it's hidden away, who cares? But it, it, if it's visible, you need to make sure it's attractive. And, and you know, in my case, because I'm doing enablement, what does the out-of-box experience look like? When I send a development system to a customer, how easy is it for them to get a machine learning algorithm up and running once they open that box. I want to make it as easy as possible. Uh, and the target we used to have is five to 10 minutes. So we wanted that to be that easy for them to, to actually get something up and running. Uh, security, another issue. Machine learning, you're going to hit here two different subclasses of topics here. Uh, one is machine, using machine learning to implement security for fraud detection, intrusion detection, and so forth. I'm not talking about that here. I'm talking about security for machine learning. And here we're talking about dealing with security issues for access to the World Wide Web, for network access. If you've got something that's connecting up to a network, that is a high risk point for hackers. So you want to make sure that, that you have a very secure system. Uh, you've got to deal with, with uh, symmetric keys, uh, with your, your transport layer security. Uh, you've got to deal with onboarding types of issues, and I've got another slide to talk about that. Data privacy issues, uh, firmware updates. You need to be able to do that in a secure manner. So there are a lot of issues here, and we actually had one individual on our team. This was his area of expertise. This is what he worked on. This uh, is essentially the life he lived on a day-to-day -day basis because these are very involved topics. Now, if you're dealing with a cloud vendor like Microsoft or Amazon or one of the others, they're going to help you with this because their APIs are going to have a lot of this baked in and they'll make that available to you. But again, there's going to be a learning curve associated with that. Sensor drivers. Again, if you're developing your own hardware, you're going to ha probably have to develop your own drivers. Now, for things that are based on I squared C or SPI, uh, typically you're going to be using uh, CMSYS type of drivers written around those particular peripherals. So effectively, the communication scheme is, is common, and you may be using similar drivers for talking to multiple sensors. The other thing I'll note is that if you've got a lot of sensors that you're sampling, you may want to use multiple buses on your board if you have that option, because that means that you can run those buses in parallel, maybe deal with them via uh, direct memory access, and that means that your latency times are more manageable. So that, you know, that's another issue to consider uh, when, you're, when you're putting together a system. And, and typically in terms of the types of functions, the drivers can be simple. Uh, uh, you know, if, if it's, it's something that you're doing for your particular application, you don't have to bake in a thousand and one options into your driver. You can bake in the option you think you're going to need, and then really all you need is initialization, read, and idle. You know, those are the three main functions that you're going to need, and idle is certainly going to be important for a tiny ML type of application. And things you're going to consider here, the physical interface, the portability uh, availability on, on your uh, PCB, the communications, DMA, uh, do you have FIFOs on your sensor or not? That can become a huge issue because if you don't have DMA or FIFOs, you're going to spend a lot of your CPU bandwidth servicing uh, those drivers. You may actually spend more time servicing those drivers than you have uh, that you're spending servicing the inference function for your machine learning model. And then data, data format conversions, secondary data types, all kinds of things that you have to deal with. Uh, QA topics, I'm not going to go through these in detail, 
because I, I know we're, we're starting to run short on time, but I think anybody who's done software development realizes when you're working with a team, you need to have the infrastructure necessary to keep things under control. If you don't, any project that's got more than two individuals on it's rapidly gonna go out of control. So you've got to spend time in terms of making sure you have the software processes necessary to do all of this stuff in a controlled manner. Oh, and one thing that we often don't talk about, but certainly if you're part of a, a large organization, you need to make sure your management is aware of the fact that you have a certain skill mix that are necessary for the team. So on our team, we had some software engineers, we had some, some uh, hardware engineers who were good for PCB design, we had some people who were good for algorithm design. We had you know, people who were good for you know, what was necessary in order to package this up and put it within the system. It takes a lot of skill sets and no one person can have all of those skills. So we found ourselves in many cases competing with the other teams within the same department for people. And that can become a major issue if you don't think about it up front. Visualization is an important topic as, as you're actually collecting data. So when we were building our data collection um, um, tool, we, we wanted to make sure that we could, we could take a peek at the data in real time. And that's important to make sure that your communications pipeline is working properly. Otherwise, if you've got a long data gathering session and you haven't actually taken a peek at your data, you may not be gathering anything. You may be wa wasting a lot of time. Uh, and as I mentioned before, bandwidth and available MIPS can impose limitations, especially if you've got something like a microphone there. And model dimensionality is an issue if you want to actually view model operation. So it's, it's very easy to, to view a simple model that's only got two features feeding it. Uh, here you see a, a, a one class support vector machine. I love to actually train these on, on an MCU. And I can watch these things training in real time, which is wonderful. I can show this to a customer and they get a very intuitive feel for how the algorithm works. If you've got uh, you know, half a dozen, seven or eight different features feeding the model, you're not gonna have this option. Uh, but it, it is nice if you have simpler models that you can get away with. Another thing that we did is, is uh, we added to our data collection tool what we call the next ray view. And, and this is something that, that I asked for because we were very cognizant of the fact that it took a lot of memory and a lot of MIPS to operate the OpenCV library we were using. Now with TensorFlow Lite for MCUs that, that a lot of the tiny ML community is using, they've got that down to a pretty small footprint. They've got it down to the, on the order of 20 kilobytes right now, which is, which is awesome. But you can still take a huge amount of space for your model. Uh, so you want to make sure that you model your me memory usage and you want to make sure that you keep track of how much time you're spending in your drivers. So we actually instrumented our code so we could see exactly how much time we were spending in our various drivers. We could see how much time we were spending in our various tasks. We were using the free RTOS operating system. So we knew how much time we were spending in a read task versus a compute, compute task, or if we were doing learning on chip, how much time were we doing for training? And I can tell you that in real time by using this screen because we instrumented our code to do it. That's a lot of work, but it's really sweet once you have it. We could even monitor our core temperature of our CPU so we can see the self-heating. Data collection and analysis, uh, just a, a couple quick words. I mentioned earlier that, that we would have the ability to run uh, data collection via our target hardware. Typically the output of that would be for each logging session, we would have one CSV file per sensor. So we ended up with an array of the number of runs times the number of sensors. And then once you run that through the feature extraction process, you end up with, with one big data file that you use for training your machine learning algorithm. So this is the, the file that usually is the starting point for all the machine learning books that you look at. This is the stuff that's not usually covered. And just as a side effect, I typically use a rolling window here so that I get more features for training from you know, 60 seconds worth of data. And by the way, for a lot of algorithms, I can get a working model 
uh, with only a minute's worth of data. Now, it, it's not going to be something that's going to be robust, robust over time, but for demonstrating the concepts, it works great. Now, if you're doing cloud-based collection analysis, this part looks the same. But now the difference is I may have tens, hundreds, or thousands or more boards feeding data up to the cloud. That means that this data is essentially going to drop into a database on a server farm someplace. And we're going to have to have a database filtering function available to us up in the cloud for cloud-based training. So this is a different type of mechanism for sorting out the data that you want to use to do your feature extraction and then your training. Uh, another point to consider here is that data uploads need to be managed to minimize cost. People like Amazon and, and Microsoft and others, they make their money every time an electron moves over a wire. So if you're sending raw data up, that's great from their perspective because they're going to be charging you more, but it's probably not going to be cost effective long time, long term. So once you've fielded uh, a system and maybe you want to collect data from your customers, you may want your little board down here actually computing the features and only send up features on an as requested basis for collecting data over time for maintenance purposes. Uh, feature engineering. Uh, as, as I mentioned, this is something that you have to spend a lot of time on if you're doing classical machine learning. Uh, it's a whole topic unto itself, so I won't go into it here. Uh, but, you know, this was an example of a case where I was trying to detect those taps in the back of the keyboard. And I actually, I ended up with some pretty nice features for being able to separate out different locations on, on the back of that, uh, that laptop. So it actually worked out pretty well. But, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at my data to, to, to try to come, to come up with a good set of features. Deep learning systems can determine features automatically, eliminating this task. But the, the caveat here is you've got to have a huge amount of data to do training for deep learning. So keep that in mind. Classical machine learning may need a lot smaller uh, data sets than if you're going to be doing something using deep learning techniques. Uh, board provision and communications, I'll, I'll leave this in the deck for people to look at. I talked about it earlier. You know, when you've got a, an initial board that you, you've developed, how do you connect it up to your local network? And then how do you connect it up to the cloud? It turns up there's a lot of handshaking that's going on and swapping keys and so forth. It has to happen in a very, very controlled fashion. So we spent a lot of time working with our cloud provider to make sure that this would work. Okay, cloud uh, computing for machine learning is very much still the Wild West. You know, everybody's got their own cloud-based services. There is a lot of overlap between them, but in, in a lot of cases, the APIs for, for IoT device access for streaming data aren't standardized. They're usually going to uh, focus on MQTT and, and RESTful uh, interfaces. So if you understand those, you'll be able to pick it up. But actually having one interface that worked across all of these different cloud providers, uh, at least up until when I left back in November, uh, that wasn't really an option for us. So they were, they were still evolving. Uh, there's a, there was a nice comparison here on, at, at this particular link that I can point you to if you want to take a look at what was available. Uh, Cross-platform support is possible for some tools like OpenCV and TensorFlow. Those are, are common things. So you can take advantage of that and you know, maybe all you have to do is, is make some changes in terms of the, the connection up to the cloud. But your, your actual algorithms may be platform independent. And the pricing models can be extremely complex. And I'll note that if you're part of a large organization like I was at NXP, oftentimes you'll have a central organization that owns all the CPU resources. And these types of interfaces to the clouds often go through them. So we found we, that we had to work with them real tightly to get access to those cloud providers from inside of our, uh, our firewalls. Uh, that turned out to take more time than we planned on. So uh, be forewarned. So here, here's our recap slide. Uh, just you know, touching on, on the high level topics again, you, know, you have to consider your hardware. You have both from, from a board perspective, 
uh, as well as your, your uh, embedded IDE or, or software development environment. You need to have some type of a data collection tool available to you. If somebody's not handing you a board and a data collection tool, you're going to have to develop your own. That takes time to do that. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, we actually worked uh, with some third-party vendors. Uh, one of them is now our sponsor here at, uh, for TinyML. Uh, that was Reality AI. So we had the ability to drop in Reality AI models as part of our system. We could use the same hardware to collect the data, upload it into their cloud, and then from their system, download a model to run here. And the intention was to be able to do that with multiple vendors. So, you know, that, that was a very nice option because a lot of your customers don't want to take the time to become machine learning experts. They don't have the time, the expertise, or the money, or they're just too busy. Uh, so, so, you know, partners like this are an important part of the puzzle. And then again, the, the open source component of this is really important you can't do all of these tools by yourself. So you want to leverage those open source capabilities as much as possible. So as I said, yeah, I was working with OpenCV. Uh, you know, there's a lot of being, uh, work being done on TensorFlow uh, in the tiny ML community. Uh, there are going to be other options out there as well. So there are a lot of different ways to, to tackle the problem. Uh, but a lot of the things I've talked about here, I think you're going to be, you're going to be finding that for real life, uh, products that you intend to develop and sell, you're going to have to deal with a lot of these issues. So that, that's why we put together this presentation. I think with that, CERN, we can open up for more questions. Great, thanks. Um, so since I want to be cognizant of people's time, uh, there, were, there are a couple questions. We're, we're probably going to have a question session for maybe 10 minutes or so. Then what I suggest we'll do is um, we'll actually close the recording and we'll stay on the line for a more informal discussion for what do people want to see for next steps, which Steve Wally will lead. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to open a poll that uh, you can provide feedback on the presentation and that kind of helps us uh, gauge uh, what people want to uh, uh, are interested in and what they would like to see. So go ahead and answer that poll. In the meantime, I'll ask a, a couple of these questions, Mike. Okay, I have a question for you first, sir. I'm, do, do I get to, 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 to uh, rank myself here? Because I've got a poll on my screen. <laughs> yes, you, yes, you can. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, I might not be able to get to all of these questions due to time. I think this one is a really good question from Mike Lisenke, which was, what was the diff what's the difference between edge computing and the part of TinyML which pushes the models and the deep neural networks or other kind of algorithms all the way to the device and the sensors? Like, where do you see like uh, that kind of uh, differentiation between edge computing and the tiny ML? I don't. Uh, I, I think tiny ML is completely applicable to edge computing. When I talk about edge computing, I'm thinking of the case where I've got, uh, you know, some type of a compute engine and here I'm talking typically about a microcontroller, some sensor that's mounted in a system someplace. That, that may be your, your smart speaker that's, that's sitting on your, uh, uh, in table, it might be a, a small board that's sitting inside your, your, your smart refrigerator or washer or dryer. All of those are edge computing. Great. Um, so um, some of these questions are very specific, like, did you use this or this uh, tool? So I'm going to actually encourage uh, audience members to go to the forums. We are going to be posting the video and a forum that will open up within a week at the TinyML website. And you can kind of ask these more specific questions uh, for a lot of these choices of uh, models. One uh, interesting question, I think like a high level was, a, is there a clear choice between an MPU and an MCU for edge machine learning? And I think the, the uh, speaker already answered that he probably thinks it's going to be, it depends. Uh, can you give us your perspective on this? Yeah, and, and in fact, you know, I, I mentioned that, that uh, you know, Sister Group was working on Alexa implementations. The first one they did was an, on an MPU. So it was an MPU running Linux. They had the ability to do full containerization. It was great, okay? It, you know, when they first got that working, everybody was just super pleased. But the, the issue is that, that typically MPUs take a lot of power and they're more expensive. Uh, both in terms of component, in terms of board space, just, you know, throughout. So one of the things that they did is they worked really hard to take the, the neural net that they were using for voice recognition 
to quantize it and squeeze it down, and they eventually fit that onto an MCU. Now, what did that mean? That meant that they were consuming less power. They were spending a lot less on, on, the, on the components, uh, both in terms of the silicon component and the board space. So they were very proud that they had the, the first MCU-enabled Alexa implementation uh, anywhere. That was a, hu a huge uh, win for them. Okay. But, you know, in general, for you're, you're going to need an MCU to get to TinyML. Uh, TinyML is looking for one milliwatt or less. That's a really tough target. You're going to have to be actively managing the low power modes on all of the, the components in your board. Great. Um, so for the sake of time, I think we're going to continue through a, a couple more slides and then stop the recording. If people want to stay on the call, we're going to have an informal discussion about the, the local chapter and so on, uh, just uh, so that I can uh, kind of go through the, a little bit of, we want to acknowledge the, our talk sponsors again, uh, including uh, uh, Edge Impulse, interested in TinyML for all developers, Maxim Integrated, which has been working on developing technologies to enable edge intelligence, uh, Synces, building ultra low power hardware, um, Reality AI, which uh, Mike Stanley actually said he, he used, uh, and you know, their uh, AutoML and AI optimization platforms, and uh, Kitso AutoML for embedded AI. So thanks again for all of these sponsors for sponsoring this web, uh, okay, uh, this webinar. Um, I'll, 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 I'll kind of end with, uh, to get in touch with us and I'll, uh, you know, you can join our meetup group. Uh, you can also uh, join at this uh, uh, via social media, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, you, you can find out more, uh, but definitely join this meetup group because that meetup group has information about the events, the webinars and the registration links to sign up via Zoom. Um, and we're, again, we're, um, after we end the recording here, we're going to open it up for people who want to talk about what they might be interested in for future uh, uh, programming in this chapter. And please, you know, check out our meetup page. It looks like this. If you type up meetup tiny ML and look at the groups, I'm sure you'll be able to find it. Find it. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop the recording here and please stay on the line and we, we'll open it up for uh, interactive conversation.